Hi there, it's James Taylor here, keynote speaker on creativity and artificial intelligence and your co-host for Event Professional Summit. Today I speak with Johnny Martinez of Shock Logic, and we talk about how to bridge the gaps between your events and content optimization. Enjoy this session. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to welcome onto this event Johnny Martinez. Johnny leads the marketing and business development front at Shock Logic. He has been working with events and association events for the past eight years since his time as events coordinator at the Global Poverty Project and his role as performance coordinator at One World Week. He is now a seasoned contributor in different event publications, including Convene Magazine, Exhibition News and Conference News, and moderates regular discussions on social media, such as the Event Planner Talks with the Mice Block. In 2017, Johnny became part of the PCMA 20 in their 20s class and also the the, um, the EN 30 under 30 class. So he's in he's very good company there as well. So, Johnny, it's an absolute pleasure having you join us today. Thank you. Thank you, James. I really appreciate it. Really happy to be here joining you guys tonight so share with us what's happening in your world just now what are you currently working on well there's a lot going on actually um uh, i've been waiting for that quiet period of the year uh, for a while <laughs> and um we don't see it coming anytime soon um but that's only good news it means we're busy um at the core of what we do at shock logic is that we support uh, associations and pcos you know streamline their day-to-day -day activities so we have a lot of um association uh, events uh, going on at the moment most of them uh, medical uh, particularly we're supporting the british society of immunology in brighton here in the uk so we're doing uh, registrations abstract management software, exhibition management software, lead retrieval solutions, the mobile app as well, um, as well as uh, managing the on-site uh, badging facilities. So we've got the team um, over there working um, round the clock uh, with the client. And I've just got back from IBTM last week in Barcelona. It was a really good show. Uh, and more uh, recently, we've also I've also been to the ECA Congress in Prague and the Forum for Your Pro Young Professionals as well, uh, where I was speaking about content bridging, bridging the gap between events and the association case study that I'll talk about a little bit more uh, later as well. Awesome. And so tell me, where, where did it, the, how did you get involved in the events industry? Where did it all begin for you? Well, it all begins with family, if I'm honest, because my dad, he's been in the industry for about 30 years. A lot of people know him. A lot of people that will be watching this interview will um, recognize his face and his name. And probably when people see me, they'll be like, oh, um, someone, someone, someone entered a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because it's what happens a lot when you see us standing next to each other. So um, I did my first internship at a company called uh, Congrex, which was a big event management company uh, that had offices all around the world. And I had the pleasure to work on association and corporate uh, client projects managing registrations and also liaising with exhibitors. So booking stands and doing specific commercial activities for the organization. And that's how um, it all really started. So in, in those early days, apart from your father, who, who were your other kind of mentors in the business? Yeah, one of my main mentors and someone I respect dearly and someone I admire dearly is Sarah Story Pugh. She's the executive director of the International Association for Professional Congress Organizers, IAPCO. And she's she's a great lady. She taught me a lot about budgeting, bidding, and what it is to be a professional uh, events organizer. And yeah, she was my employer when I started at Congrex at the time. But in 2014, I attended the um, IAPCO annual seminar in Wolfsburg in Switzerland. And she uh, led the program and I left, you know, feeling so inspired that 
I knew this was the right thing to do and you know I'd found my place in the right industry so I'm really happy. So I mentioned you mentioned earlier that you you just you've been at an event recently where you've been talking about this idea of bridge, bridging the gaps between the gaps. So uh, describe what that is and 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 the, I know you did the, the these kind of association kind of case studies as part of that. What were some of the things that you you were kind of talking to that group about? Yeah, one challenge that we really see today um, in association events and especially, uh, you know, membership based organizations or um, organizations that have a um, main Congress happening every year or every two years is that a lot of the members rely on obviously these major activities and we don't find enough facilities for them to connect with other members throughout the year, but also to engage with the activities that the organization has to offer and all the initiatives that will be taking place in the next event. So the question is, what can we do and how can we do it so, you know, we keep them engaged and we first of all, bridge the gap between those events, but also bridge the gap um, in the membership. Because you now find a very diverse membership when you look at any association. You have a more uh, doctors, researchers and academics that have been members for many, many years, more senior uh, representatives and you have uh, more younger professionals now coming in, you know, bringing new ideas mm -hmm. and quite anxious about getting the technology to work and getting the more traditional base to, you know, come on board with some of the new initiatives. And it's quite tricky, actually, trying to bridge the gap between uh, these uh, people. And that's something that we look at when we talk about uh, Bridge, um, about bridging the gap between the gaps as you said so that part i mean that's a, i think that's quite a common theme where i'm hearing throughout this event just now as well where you've got especially like millennials younger generations kind of coming through into uh, whether it's companies or associations and many of them have also gone through a, a way of being educated now where it's like a more flipped classroom so they're not so used to about sitting there in a classroom for an hour long lecture and 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 it's it's kind of different you know and they're, they're used to engaging with the lecturers or, or people in, in a slightly different way so how, how are you bridging that gaps because maybe from maybe those people i know you do a lot of the kind of medical medical events as well medical conventions and you know i think about that as you know being quite a traditional type of industry as well so how do you how do you go about bridging those first of all that demographic gap yeah, I think it's a, it's key to understand, first of all, that any initiative and any change that we want to introduce into one of these organizations has to be um, gradual and it has to be, uh, it also has to be modest in many ways. Mm. When we started working with the European Society of Organ Transplantation back in 2009, we, uh, we understood uh, their processes. We came in, we sat down and we uh, looked at how they were doing things and how they were managing their content at the time. A lot of the content that the society uh, manages is obviously very much scientific. And in uh, back in the days, obviously, this is... Um, um, I'm probably too young to, to, to talk about any first-hand experience uh, when it comes to like hard, um, hard copies uh, that people used to submit uh, to some of these associations whenever they wanted their paper to be considered. Um, so and I'm, I'm quite lucky to today see uh, platforms like the ones that we offer where the submission of all these scientific papers happens all online. Mm. Um, so when it comes to, uh, I mean, I'm already talking about a move from paper to digital, yeah. right? Which is basically the first thing that happened. And that is the first thing that we do to assist our clients. If they're looking for that move from paper to digital, 
then we are happy to suggest uh, ways on how to do that. Um, so bringing the collection of the content and the material online is one thing. And then what we do next is uh, think about how to distribute that content in, a, in an efficient way to uh, all the different participants and all the different members of these organizations. And as you said, because you need to think about the different needs of the audience, you know, younger and older generations, um, you know, we understood that uh, more traditional uh, sources, like actual printed um, copies of the program, were still needed for a while. But it was to put in place a plan so people would increasingly, in, increasingly get used to some of the digital initiatives that we introduced, such as the mobile app. Mm -hmm. The mobile app was key to... Uh, it was key for us to build uh, that community and for us to bring everyone together. Um, the mobile app extends the event life cycle of the event because it creates a platform where members can keep in touch with each other throughout the year, but at the same time, they have access to the content that is produced from Congress to Congress uh, through the app. And they can also contact, you know, presenters and submitters through it. And with the app, uh, as well as a 24-hour um, webcast channel that we had where uh, every single session at the event gets recorded, mm -hmm. And they all uh, go on a, on an online platform that you know is accessible for members. Those non-members then have a access to some of this content uh, for a fee. This creates a new revenue stream now yeah. for the association. And uh, finally, what we do, you know, some of those, some of the scientific papers then become posters. And until 2013, we did uh, printed physical posters, but from, uh, from then onwards, we introduced e-posters. So people were able to browse through, uh, the, uh, through the research posters in the app, but also on site at the event, they were able to uh, browse and search through them on touch screens. On the webcast one, was there? I, I'm, I'm putting my mind in, 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 putting my head in the the space of the of the, the owner of the event, let's say, um, and, and I'm thinking, isn't that a dangerous thing to start putting some of these sessions up online, making them available? Will people still want to spend the money to come to the event? Will they not just stay? Up? So, how did you how did you broach that subject? How did you kind of deal with that with the client? Yeah. So one um, one great thing to to point out, especially when you introduce all of these things, is how this um, what is the ROI for the client, right? When you think about something like uh, the webcast channel or the e-posters, these are uh, first of all items that uh, you know any sponsor would be uh, interested in. Uh, participating in, you know, getting involved with, mm. because you very easily can put, you know, your branding uh, or any message that you want to put out there on, on one of these platforms. So one answer to your question is that very, you, very easily we can sell this to a sponsor and this is a new revenue stream that we can sell to a sponsor. Mm. And the other thing is that, um, you know, going again from paper to digital, uh, all these solutions save the organizer uh, time, paper, resources, um, space around the venue. It also allows uh, participants to, uh, to add last minute changes to uh, their scientific papers, because if it's printed, 
you know, you, it goes to print and that's it. You know, you bring it to the event and there's not much that you can do. Um, so all of these factors, um, when we put together all of these factors and we explain to them, you know, this is how much money you're going to save, not only how much money you're going to save, but this is also how much money you can make out of, you know, all these items that can be sponsored. Um, it really becomes, uh, you know, invaluable tools mm. for the organizer. But it's all about how you explain uh, the story. And what about that, you know, that you mentioned, it's like kind of moving into a little bit into kind of content strategy now as well throughout, you know, between the events, the, between the main events. Um, who is, is that something that your team is coming and basically kind of building that content strategy, essentially that content marketing kind of strategy around it? Or is that something that the associations and the, or the organizations are primarily doing and you're really coming in to help provide the platforms and the technologies and everything behind it? Well, interestingly, um, with, with ESOT, we had introduced the technology and the event was and still is very successful uh, around what it delivers on the technology side. At the same time, we somehow needed to tell the story on what we had done and what we were about to do for 2017. Mm. So the client came up to us and said, well, I need, I wanna engage the audience in a new way. And that's when we thought, okay, why don't we do this through video? And we start introducing uh, all the different initiatives uh, through video. And then our clients said, okay, great, but we need to, someone needs, someone needs to, st to tell the story. And that's when we um, thought about the possibility of having a storyteller. Hmm. Now, the, 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 the storyteller, we, we, we then decided that it was going to be a, a character. And many questions came up. Is it going to be a man? Is it going to be a woman? Uh, how old is that person going to be? Is it going to be dark skin? Is it going to be light skinned? And I guess in 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 the, in the world of today, you know, we are uh, trying to be as as inclusive as we can. So we knew that we needed to create a character of diversity, and that's how uh, Gaudino, the dragon came about so what was gaudino's role in you thought this kind of storyteller role was was where where did that fit in was gaudino like almost like a, a mascot for the event or was gaudino there to kind of link d different sessions and, and different things and, and and link all the all the pieces together yeah so i mean i think uh all of the descriptions that you mentioned are quite valid um you know he was the storyteller uh, and he was the main reference all participants and, and, and members were looking for when they uh, when they were engaging in communications that uh, the association was sending to them. So you would basically see them in most of the newsletters. So, so it was coming from Gaudino. The, the the newsletters, the communications were coming from that character. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because I think that's that that's often a challenge. I think a lot of associations have where. You know, a lot of more modern styles of marketing, we, we know to send it first person. Um, but at the same time, sometimes the CEO of the organization or the, the chief executive doesn't feel comfortable necessarily being that voice because they have a different type of voice. So you you basically create the character in order to be the voice of the association. I think the association already has very strong voices, if I'm honest mm. with you. He ha the the executive, uh, the CEO of ESOT, uh, Annalisa Ponkia, she really is a trailblazer because she um, she was she was uh, what the, what, she was the one that suggested uh, having the character, and then we had to start think uh, we had to start thinking what the character was going to look like. Um, actually, there was some resistance from the committee in the beginning. I have to say, this is probably one of the most forward-thinking committees that we've um, ever worked with. But uh, more than anything, um, Gaudino was coming to, you know, to refresh the content and the engagement that we wanted to get out of uh, the, uh, the, the gap between the events 
and he yeah he became the main ambassador in um, enhancing that engagement and you know bringing it a step forward and what were some of the other kind of um out some of the other things that just kind of happened that you maybe didn't expect by introducing that kind of storytelling that character into the event you didn't maybe initially plan for but they happened and you got that feedback as the uh, congress uh as in the lead up to the congress as we were approaching the congress in september we were told that there was going to be a new format uh of presentation uh for the for for, for the congress and it's something that was called the elevator pitch hmm. and it was very unique because it was uh dedicated to researchers that uh, were shortlisted and they had 10 minutes to present their scientific work and if they were successful they would then have a long presentation slot during the congress to uh, develop further on what they had just presented and that was really interesting because Gaudino had to introduce this new concept. He had to, uh, through a series of animations, he had to explain what it was all about. And it was interesting for us because it really um, got us thinking on how to present uh, so many guidelines and instructions, you know, in a in a two minute video. And it was actually really successful. Um, the aim of this format and the contribution that we had with Gaudino is that we actually created competitive science because you have all these researchers and all these academics actually feeling quite a bit under pressure because yeah. they know they're going to be next to uh, their peers you know presenting their work it's like a, like in like, it's like in the uk we have like the, the uh, and i don't know if it's in the states well but the dragon's den thing where it is like high pressure and there's like there's the the, the, the music's kind of going there and it's like well what's the going to be the response <laughs> so 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 and I, you don't often think about that in in a, a medical or a research context so I, i'm also wondering was was there resistance to that in 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 the in, in the research community in the medical community i think um i think there's always resistance to everything <laughs> <laughs> because because change is really scary for everyone and i think when you introduce a lot of these new initiatives you will find people wondering if it was a good idea and you will find people concerned about putting people off hmm. you know when it comes to applying to these kind of things. Um, so, so yeah, I agree with that. At the same time, it is very hard to grow if we don't step out of our comfort zone. And that's why, uh, you know, obviously we invite all our clients and we invite uh, all the different stakeholders that we work with to actually try new initiatives. Um, because that's when we realize if what we were doing was working or not. And if there's something else that we need to offer our members, because mm. end of the day, you know, we, um, you know, we're here to innovate, and they expect that kind of innovation uh, one way or another. So when you're having that conversation and you and you're taking for you're taking different possi uh, um, possibilities to a client, um, and I'm just thinking just now for anyone that's watching this just now that maybe they have a client, maybe they have an association that they work with or, or a corporate client. And they're trying to get that balance right between pushing things and, and innovating and at the same time not getting fired and, and, and not taking the comfort, the client too far out of their comfort zone. Any, any tips for working with clients in that way? Yeah, I think some, you know, sometimes, I don't know if you've seen that video, um, when there's a little character telling another one, oh, I want an iPhone. And then the other character says, why do you want an iPhone? And the character replies, because it's an iPhone. I want an iPhone, you know? And what I'm trying to say is that sometimes we want to do something for the sake of doing something and we want to introduce a type of technology for the sake of just introducing that technology. Mm. And quite often what, what we need to do is to really sit down with a client 
understand their processes. We believe that there's no te- there's no good technology without a good process. So if we don't focus on actually understanding the process and making sure that the process works and that the technology accommodates for that, um, then we um, it, then it's not a good start. Um, that needs to be done uh, in the especially in the pre-planning stage, and then is to and then what we need to do is to really understand the audience, to really understand the membership base, and really understand their needs. Um, see how they interact with your content, because quite often we don't really measure these kind of things. We don't we don't know how many uh, downloads you know a specific piece of content has had on our website. We don't know how uh, we don't know what was the most popular um, page on the scientific program book, for example. And obviously bringing a lot of these uh, solutions digital allows us to be able to measure a lot of these things. Mm. And, it's, it, and it's a big reason why when we sit down with our clients and when we, when we sit down with different partners and we go about and, and we try to define out, you know, what is it, what is it that is, is best for the client? Well, quite often it is what you can measure and what you can reflect on. So you have data that you can show your colleagues and you can show your members and say, this is actually working, this is not working, let's change it a little bit, let's bring new technology. Um, But all of this has to be done with a plan and it has to be done with um, an analysis carried out. Uh, And what about, I know many associations, they will have some kind of continual professional development for their their members throughout the course of the year, like medical or or legal or accounting, for example. Um, And I'm wondering how have you looked in terms of helping maybe some of these associations generate new revenue streams? from uh from doing that as well because that seems like that's the kind of often the gaps and i think of myself and other friends and family members who are maybe the doctors or lawyers and they said there's a real variance in the quality of that cpd that goes on between the events and so many of them now said we go to these events actually in person events and frankly i sit there and i think i could have done a webinar for this and i would have saved myself the travel time on it so so what, yeah. what what are some of the things that you're finding that's working with some of your clients yeah so um we see more and more people going into the hybrid model so having a face-to-face element as well as a virtual element to the congress so what that means is that um, obviously if you're going to offer these two things they need to be well organized mm. and quite often a lot of organizers fear that um, that there's going to be cannibalism uh, between the virtual element and the face-to-face element and um, what we have found is that in most cases pretty much in every case the virtual element only added to the conference mm. so if there was, if there were delegates or if there were members, if there's a specific audience that couldn't attend your event in the first place, it's probably because of financial reasons. It might be too far away, depending on where you're hosting the congress. So, um, offering the online facility is a way to overcome uh, this, because we we see a lot of clients being able to offer uh, reduced rates on the attendance to the online facility of the conference. Um, so this already creates a new revenue stream for uh, the association. I mean, to give you an example, the Goal Lactation Conference, which is dedicated to lactation consultants, um, is a conference that happens in Canada every year, and the 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 conference is actually completely vir- virtual. Um, lactation consultants are people that don't earn a lot of money, and quite frankly, find it very difficult to pay a full registration fee and you know travel across the world to attend the conference. So the conference happens completely online, mm. and um, the key thing here is uh, is to you know make sure that uh, you provide guidelines on the type of connection that everyone should have. You know, if they want to attend the conference, um, and also have uh, moderated uh, timed sessions. It allows for speakers, you know, as as well to uh, be able to deliver the session uh, in anywhere 
in the world there may be. Um, so this really facilitates a lot of things. Yeah. It's interesting because, and we've had some guests on here that, that run uh, events and some of them actually run it almost the opposite way. So they come at it from a virtual, from an online first perspective and then they're doing the live events. So some of them say, actually, the reason we run our live events is because, well, one, it, obviously it's nice to bring the virtual community together in one place, but actually the biggest goal that we have is to allow us to create content for our for the virtual side so said so, you know we've we've you know it's, it's almost and it's like basically kind of flipping the whole the whole thing upside down as well um just we start to finish up here as, as well uh, i know you're obviously very involved in the kind of technology side as well and we're going to be talking a little bit about you know shock logic and i know you, you that you cover a lot of that area as well but if there was is there one app or tool or like mobile app that you find really useful for doing the work that you do there's so many and do you know what? Um, I actually wrote an article about this, which I can also make available uh, to some of the people listening. But we, I, I, I actually recently talked about Monzo. I don't know if you heard of Monzo. Yeah. M O N Z O. So it's actually, um, it's actually uh, an online banking facility. You have to apply for it. Uh, you download it on your iPhone or you download it on your Android and you apply for a card and then you get a card like this. So it's quite funky because it's, um, I don't know what color this is, but I will call it, <laughs> I will call it electric pink. Yeah, electric pink. The 1980s <laughs> disco pink. <laughs> exactly. And, um, and, and, and you know what the great thing is about this is that um, I, can, I can travel anywhere and they charge me no fees. Oh. And, and it's interesting for me because, you know, as me traveling everywhere for events uh, and needing, you know, the facility to, you know, get money whenever I can, I use this everywhere, you know, to, to be able to do that. But at the same time, uh, you know, I'm able to make transfers uh, to, 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 to any other person. So maybe that's more for the personal side, but I find, I find that very useful. That's a cool I find, I find I find the app um, extremely useful, and the um, another I I really like uh, WhatsApp. Just generally, uh, we we tend to communicate uh, about if we're going on site for an event, uh, even if we're having a client coming for, coming in for a demo. And there are a number of people from different teams that I need involved, you know, in that specific project. Then, you know, we just create a quick chat there, mm. um, especially for those, you know, events that, you know, going to happen, you know, for three days, or just one day. And right there, you know, we shoot files, pictures. Uh, oh, can you take a picture there? You know, I need it for social media. Uh, they send it pretty quickly. I'm also able to send voice notes. And I think that's a cultural thing. Cause, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I would, I, I've, I've been doing this more and more because a couple of friends of mine has just been sending voice notes now to you on Facebook. And, uh, and it's like, why have I not done this before? Because it saves me so much time from having to write. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and what about actually, maybe let's go to the old school. What about a book? If there was one book that you could recommend, it could be on the events industry, it could be on business, um, uh, it could be an experiential side. You mentioned the kind of storytelling side earlier. What would that book be? You think people should check out? My my dad and I we um, we actually we've read and we um, we talk a lot about first of all the Seven Habits of Highly Effective uh, People by Stephen Co Covey, mm -hmm. and is is essentially a manual for life. And it, it takes you through, you know, all the different principles on how to have successful relationships with other people. Um, we believe about creating win-win relationships, which is something that he uh, highlights uh, on the book. Uh, we really recommend it to everyone. And we, um, I speak Spanish, so we've been writing a column on uh, each one of the habits uh in spanish so obviously that's that's also the, that's not something that we can also make available to some people and the um sorry the other book i was going to recommend is don't make me think don't make me think as well well i hope actually while we've um 
Well, we've been doing this interview today. This is, I know, one of the things on, on that seven habits is sharpening the saw, I think. So hopefully we've been helping everyone kind of sharpen their saws in terms of the, as event professionals as well. Um, you have kindly offered to put together, um, you put together a, a white paper on, on planning your content strategy, which is, covers some of the things that goes in a lot more kind of depth as well. We're going to have a link here so people can kind of go and get that as well. So people can check that great white paper as well. If they want to learn more about, uh, shock logic and, uh, you know, and, and some of the, you know, the, the product you offer and the, uh, how you kind of help, uh, you know, other event professionals, where's the best place for them to go to do that? Uh, please go to our website, www.shocklogic.com. Also, our Vimeo channel uh, gives you a visual uh, perspective on everything that we've done. Lots of really cool case studies. So that's uh, vimeo.com forward slash shocklogic. Those would be the best places, really. Awesome. Well, Johnny, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure speaking with you uh, today. Thank you so much for, for coming on and and introducing me to this this idea of actually of the storyteller role and a character. I'm actually thinking about that for some of our events now. So I, I think that's a, that's a really interesting kind of insight. I wish you all the best with all the events that you have and hopefully you get a little bit of a chance to rest before your the next event you have coming up. <laughs> Thank you, James. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure.